So the MPS diseases and mucolipidosis, which is also a disease that the MPS Society advocates for, are a group of rare lysosomal storage diseases. These are too rare to test ahead of um, uh, reproductive choices for families. Uh, so it is caught either by newborn screening or uh, through clinical diagnosis. And often because of the rarity, the clinical diagnosis comes very late, relatively speaking, after much irreversible disease may have taken place. There is a lot of excitement here uh, in terms of the development of therapeutics and also in terms of an understanding of the diseases. When I started out working in these uh, diseases in 1998, there were no approved therapies. Early in the 2000s, MPS1 had an enzyme replacement therapy approved. And we now have enzyme replacement therapy for MPS1, MPS2, MPS4A, MPS6, and MPS7. However, these are not complete therapies. Uh, and there are both public health issues that need to be addressed, as well as therapeutic improvements to uh, help us attain a full or a, as complete a, a therapeutic potential as possible. Really, we need to have newborn screening as universally adopted as possible for these diseases. And that is a huge public health uh, initiative. And we're making great progress. So MPS1 has been approved on the RUSP and we have approximately two thirds of the population living in a state where MPS1 is or soon will be screened for. MPS2 has just been approved by the committee that evaluates nominations and that um, approval has been submitted to the Secretary of the Health and Human Services uh, for his signature uh, and then that will become a recommended screening. Uh, however, because we have a federalized system in this country, that's only a recommendation. It has no power of law. It is up to individual states to initiate that. So there's still a need for advocacy at the state level. And of course, as I mentioned, we have treatments for MPS4A, 6, and 7, and those are in need of both nominations and pilot project data to support those nominations, and then hopefully adoption by states. So there's a lot of important work uh, at the public health level and at the advocacy level. When it comes to the development of therapeutics, there are a lot of exciting developments. I'd like to say some of these are new, but honestly, most of them have their roots back over two decades. Uh, when I first got started in this area, I was at a symposium hosted by one of the, I would say, founders of the field, Liz Newfeld, out at UCLA in 2001. And many of the therapies that are cutting edge at this moment were presented in some form at that symposium. So fusion proteins that cross the blood-brain barrier, which is now the basis of therapeutics being developed by Denali and by JCR for MPS2, and they are hoping to move into areas of uh, delivery of other enzymes for lysosomal storage diseases. That was presented at that early symposium. So, and it's taken us this long to get to a place where we're starting to see clinical trials evaluate this therapeutic. The beauty of this kind of therapy is it is an enzyme replacement therapy. It's given intravenously on a weekly basis. And because there is a fusion protein, with a ligand that binds the endothelium of the brain vasculature or the central nervous system vasculature, from that binding, it can be transcytosed across the blood-brain barrier and thereby get into the parenchyma of the central nervous system via a uh, IV administration. So a really elegant and wonderful approach. And the early clinical trial data that has been presented for both JCR and Denali, and they employ different techniques, but the basic premise is the same. It's a blood-brain barrier crossing therapeutic. That's going to, I hope, provide a much improved landscape of treatment.
I've talked about the brain disease. So our diseases, broadly speaking, are often categorized as neuropathic or non-neuropathic. Um, and even within the same disease, for example, MPS1, there can be a spectrum of disease from a severe phenotype, which is a patient who has uh, neuropathic disease, to a attenuated form, a patient who does not have overt neurodegenerative and cognitive decline, non-neuropathic. What we are appreciating is that even among these patients who have non-neuropathic disease, we are seeing some issues of mild cognitive impairment. And so there may be a place for these blood-brain barrier crossing therapeutics, even in treatment of disorders where we didn't appreciate that there was a strong or actively neurodegenerative disease course occurring. So that's a really important development, uh, this uh, a therapy that can be administered peripherally and treat the brain disease. Other areas of exciting development involve new capsids of AAV vectors. So AAV is a kind of virus. It stands for adeno-associated virus. These are classed as what we call dependoviruses. They cannot reproduce on their own. And they're very small. They're also related to parvo. Well, they're a kind of parvovirus. There are a number of these novel AAVs that are being found all the time. And we can also induce uh, or select for, for variants, as it were, that have a tropism or a predilection to bind different tissues. And the beauty of this approach would be you could administer an AAV vector intravenously, and it could have a tropism for the vasculature of the brain or figure out how to get across that vascular uh, bed and into the parenchyma of the brain. Uh, or we could find a, a AAV vector that does a better job of transducing cartilage, which is a cell type that is traditionally extremely difficult to transduce. And that brings up another issue. In addition to neuropathic disease in the MPS and ML disorders, we also see a lot of somatic disease. For example, uh, disease in cartilage. Uh, as individuals mature, that gets set into bone. Uh, we see heart valve disease. We see disease of cartilage in the trachea, in the structures of the upper airways, in the lungs. Uh, we see clouding of eyes. We see storage in kidney, liver, spleen. Uh, and that is also a, a serious element of disease. On average, we could say diseases have either predominantly somatic or skeletal disease or predominantly central nervous system disease, or they could have a mixed pathology. Mixed pathology diseases include MPS1, MPS2, MPS7. Diseases that have exclusively orthopedic or skeletal or somatic disease would be MPS4, A and B, and MPS6. And then diseases that have almost exclusively central nervous system or neuropathic disease, those would be San Filippo syndrome, which includes four subtypes. Now, having said that, we absolutely know that there are minor or relatively minor manifestations of orthopedic and cardiac disease in San Filippo, but the overwhelming phenotype is a neuropathic one. Uh, and likewise, as I said, even though some of the disorders that are primarily skeletal or involve uh, um, somatic tissue manifestations, they might have some mild aspects of cognitive impairment. So there are exciting developments in uh, AAV vector uh, development. There's also a very exciting development, but again, this is one that's actually quite old, relatively speaking to gene therapy. So now I think over a decade and a half ago, uh, a group in Milan started developing lentiviral vectors that were quite safe. And they developed an approach of using them to insert a transgene into hematopoietic stem cells in a Petri dish. So the approach would involve a patient with a serious 
metabolic disorder or an immune deficiency. And a lot of this was done first in severe combined immunodeficient uh, individuals. They would mobilize stem cells. They would introduce this lentiviral vector with the transgene in vitro after they cultured these stem cells. They would do some purification and some quality control. And then they would introduce these stem cells back into the individual. This is an autologous transplant. So there's no worry about graft versus host. And it doesn't require you to do a seriously uh, myeloablative uh, uh, approach to wiping out their bone marrow. You may only need to get a small percentage of the transgene uh, transduced stem cells back into the bone marrow compartment and you can have a significant improvement. Well, this approach now has been trialed in MPS1 and there were some results recently presented at uh, the World Symposium uh, in 2022, this February, uh, out of a group in Milan who tried this approach in MPS1 and the results are extremely exciting. And if this approach can be extended to uh, diseases such as MPS2 or diseases where there's primarily somatic disease, such as MPS4 or 6, and those that have primarily uh, neurocognitive issues, we could see a huge advance. Again, one of the tricks here is we have to get these patients early in life, and that will mean uh, hopefully universal adoption of newborn screening for these disorders.